And we're live here at Roxim Live. My name is Tim Van Milligan. Thank you for showing up today. Uh, this is a video. Ah, I've got a poster down here <laughs> that we're going to be giving away today. So if, uh, if you'd like to win a poster, uh, go ahead and put your name in the comments and also where you're located. Um, so you can see this is the Zephyr. It's, this, the poster we're giving away is actually bigger than the one that's here on the wall, which is kind of cool. Um, as I said, my name is Tim Van Milligan. This is Roxim Live. This is where we teach people how to use Roxim. Um, we are kind of have a whole lower question from last week that we're going to talk about. Um, let me, I got a monitor over here. That's kind of why I'm looking off here to the side. Um, so let me bring up my computer. I'm trying to see who's here today. We have various Kaminsky. <laughs> Brian Barbalis, Ronald Zacker. Uh, thanks for showing up, guys. We appreciate you guys being here. Um, we had Ron Kaminsky. Is it the same one as Various Kaminsky? Um, Ron Kaminsky is really trying to get in his, this time. Okay, Ron is here. Um, I got a question for Ron that we're holding over so that we're going to start with that one. But first, let me bring up my computer screen here so that... Uh, you can see what I'm looking at on my computer. Let me adjust it here. I got, I got a little bit behind because we're trying something new. You can see we've got a second camera focused on me where it's just my head um, <laughs> so that you can actually see what I'm looking like while I'm talking here on the video. Let me uh, bring up another browser window. So if, if you are not familiar with Roxim. Uh, Roxim is our software that we sell. Um, to find it, to download it, you can go here in this banner bar on the top of the screen and you'll see the banner here says Roxim. You can click on that and that will take you to information where you can find Roxim. You can download a free trial. You can order it there. There's upgrades for people that had Roxim in the past. Um, all that is available here on our website. Uh, one thing I forgot to do is to change the size of my cursor so that you can see as I'm moving around. So I'm going to do that real quick. Um, kind of excuse me for doing this. I got a little bit behind, as I said. I'm going to make the cursor a little bit bigger. See, now the cursor is big. All right. If you have a question, go ahead and type it into the comments field and I can answer that as we get to time. Uh, but Ron Kaminsky asked about airfoiling fins. Did I answer this question last time, Ron? Um, and he also had a question about offset weights inside the rocket. And then we had a question from Rick DeFossis about subassembly. How do you create a subassembly? Um, oh, we got more people joining us. We have Joshua Drummond. That's a new name. Jeff Joranson. Hello, Jeff from Orlando. Uh, Joe Matera. Uh, Chris Munson. Uh, Chris asks, thanks for doing this. I tried to add a drag plate to the base of my five inch intimidator just to play with the numbers. What I got back was an increase. Uh, that's a good question, Chris. I'm not sure what a drag plate is. Um, I think that you might be talking about an article that somebody wrote about Roxim and how to increase the accuracy. Um, so I'm not sure if I can answer that one, Chris, because I'm not exactly sure what you're asking about there. Okay, so um, Ron, I'm, I'm waiting to hear back from you. So did I answer your question last week, Ron? I can't remember. Uh, but the one that I know I didn't answer was uh, Rick DeFoss's question about subassemblies. So we'll go ahead and start with some assemblies, and that shouldn't take too long. Um, if you're in Roxim, 
let me open up a, a design here. I think um, I'll try this Lodestar rocket. Now, see here on the desk, I got a Lodestar. Uh, it's a two-stage rocket, and what it has at the top, you can't see because it's outside of my camera. Um, it has a payload bay, and a payload bay could be a good um, place where you might want to use a sub-assembly. So I'm going to go here back onto my computer, and I want to open up the Estes Lodestar. Um, go to my design folder, and this is all out of order, so let me go in order here, Estes. And here's the Lodestar. Let's open that up. And so here is the Lodestar, bringing it around. Um, I got to quit out of some of these programs that are popping up notifications. <laughs> They're kind of distracting. Um, okay, so what is a subassembly? Um, so to, to explain what a subassembly is, it helps to start right here at the top. These are placeholders. So it is a placeholder that parts are gonna be added to. So you can see I got a sustainer and a booster. And to those placeholders, we're adding parts. It's like I can add a body tube here. And you can see down here, um, as I click on them, I'm in actually Roxim 10.3 which is one of the new versions that we're working on. Um, and one of the features that I showed last week is that it highlights the parts down here in the drawing um, so that I can just click on them and it will find the parts so I know what I'm editing is actually what I think I'm editing. Um, but getting back to, okay, so a body tube here is a placeholder. And if I click on the booster, you know, nothing's highlighted um, to, to see the entire thing so that it's not ghosted like you, like you see. You just click off of the rocket anywhere. So I'm just going to click off there. Um, so this is a placeholder. The sustainer is a placeholder. And then there's two additional placeholders. One of them is sub-assemblies, and the other one is a pod. Now, the difference between those two placeholders is um, a pod is for parts added to the outside of a rocket, and sub-assemblies are parts added inside the rocket. Um, so that's how Roxim treats them differently. So like I say, you know, a payload bay that you move from one rocket to another rocket would be a good candidate for a subassembly because that's the purpose is it's a collection of parts and then we can move those parts from one rocket to another part of the rock to a different completely different part to completely different rocket <laughs> i got two cameras up there and i'm all confused which one to look at <laughs> um so if i wanted to use this payload bay in another rocket um this would be a good candidate for subassemblies. So, um, so what I'm going to do, so first you have to add the subassembly. So it has to be added to another part. So I'm going to click on the nose cone, and you'll see down here is the subassembly button. So I'm going to click on the subassembly button. Um, and it's asking me, is the new subassembly to be owned by the nose cone? And I'll say yes. Why not? Um, okay, so you, you see that it added the subassembly down here, and then it brought up this window for subassemblies. So the way this is going to work is we're going to create a subassembly and save it, then we're going to add parts to it, and then save it again. So that it's a process of two times you have to save it. Once without the parts to kind of get it started, and then the second time is once you get all the parts added. Um, and the reason for this is because Roxim is going to save the subassembly to the database like it is its own design. So it's like its own rocket design. So that when we go to add it to another rocket, we can call it up. So, um, so I'm gonna call this one um, a BT-60 uh, payload. Let me spell it right, payload bay. And then I got to give it a file name. 
Um, and it can be the same file name. So I'm going to do a copy and paste. Um, so now this is the first time where I'm going to save it. So I'm going to click Save Parts to a File. So then when if I'm in a different design and I want to use this new subassembly, then I would say load parts from a file. So then I'm going to load them all into the, into the design. But at this point, I'm going to save it. So I'm going to save parts to the file. And it should ask me a name and where I want to save it. So um, I'm going to call it BT60 payload sub assembly. So I know what it is. And I'll just throw it in the same folder and then just click save. Okay, so now at this point, I'm gonna click okay. Okay, so now I have a payload bay and there's no parts attached to it. And you can see it looks like a file folder because we're gonna stuff other parts inside of this. Um, so now I gotta figure out which parts I wanna stuff inside. And I'm gonna take these two parts right here and I'm gonna stuff them inside. So. I'm gonna do, click on that tube. I'm gonna right click and it brings up this little menu. This is so I can copy it. So I'm gonna do copy. Then I'm gonna come back up here and I'm gonna paste. And it says, is it gonna be part of the selected subassembly? I'm gonna say yes. So now I have a clear payload bay in that part subassembly. And you can see here is this subassembly and it's highlighted. Um, and so I'm gonna take this other clear payload and I'm gonna delete it. Delete and see what happens. Huh, okay, so. <laughs> okay, we'll fix it. See what, I don't know if you can see what's happening here. Um, let me see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. So we have a clear payload bay and then the nose cone. And the nose cone, um, so we're gonna have to move the location of this payload bay. And let's see if I can do it right now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna click on that, double click to open it. And it goes, it goes back to this screen here. Let's see if you guys can see this. Okay, so you can. Okay, so then it says uh, changing the location will reposition all the parts in this subassembly. So I'm going to reposition this. It wants to attach that nose cone to the wrong spot. Hmm, interesting. It's maybe because I, I attached that subassembly to the nose. That's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, also, um, we're at the same, <clears throat> the same screen that we were before. I got a tickle in my throat. <clears throat> Excuse me for that. Um, um, so I'm back at the subassembly screen right here. I am still alive. Michelle says I'm still alive. I don't. Safari so completely shut off, and I have. It's a it's a miracle that I'm still alive. <laughs> okay, so I am on uh, my subassembly, and I'm going to click um, save parts to file just to say that. And. Um, I'm gonna save that name and it's gonna ask me if I'm gonna override it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So say save, replace. So now this new subassembly has saved and it's got a new part added to it. So I'm gonna click okay here. And now what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete the subassembly because it, it's, it's attached to the nose cone. I should have tested this yesterday. Delete, say yes. Okay, so now Click on subassembly again. Subassembly. I'm going to say no this time. Okay, so it, it added the subassembly. Cool. This is the way I should have done it first time. I shouldn't have attached it to the nose cone. 
So now I'm going to load parts from the file, and there's only one part loaded so far, and that's that uh, body tube. So I'm going to click open there. <sighs> cool. It did it right this time. So you can see that it moved the nose cone off of there. All right. Okay, so we have now my subassembly starts with this tube, and I also want to add this transition to it. So I'm going to do another copy here. I'm going to come up here to the subassembly, and I'm going to paste it to that clear payload tube. Paste. And now we have a transition there. You can see kind of ghosted down here. I got a, I got the wrong thing. I, I know how I quit it before I quit my uh, Safari when I should have quit the uh, <laughs> my mail program. So I got two uh, transitions here, and I want to delete this second one. So that's the second one, and I'm going to hit delete. You can also come up here to the edit menu. Um, oh, I don't have a delete there. The only way I can delete it also from here. So I can hit delete there and say yes, and that should go away. So now the transition is attached to the payload bay. So now I'm going to go back to the payload bay because it has new parts in it. And I am going to save this file. And it's going to ask me the same thing again. I'm going to, again, I'm going to override it. Uh, I'm going to overwrite it um, and hit replace. And then it saved it. Okay, so now we've got a subassembly created. So, okay. So now I am going to open up a new design, or I'm going to start a new design. Um, so I'm going to go to new design, uh, save changes, and I say no. Okay, so I'm going to start with the nose cone, and it's got to be a BT60. So here's a BT60. There's my nose cone. Click OK. Um, and now I can add that subassembly. So I'm going to hit subassembly. Is it going to be owned? And I'm going to say no again. Uh, load parts from the file. Choose that subassembly. Click open. It added it. Um, click OK. Now our next part, we want to add a body tube. And say no, it's not going to be owned by the subassembly. And we need a BT55 this time, which is a 33 millimeter tube. Click OK there. And it added it. And now I can add fins to this one. And click Cancel there. And it just added a generic set of fins. Click OK. Oops, I didn't um, have a material. That's good to see. This is the one that uh, people always forget to, to change their material. It doesn't do it for you. you got to select it yourself. Click OK. So now we have a new rocket designed using the subassembly. So to kind of recap on the subassembly, you're going to create the subassembly. Um, then you're going to save it. Then you can add parts to it. And then save it again just to make sure all the parts are there. And now the subassembly can be used in other designs. Um, subassemblies, again, are for internal parts. They're, they're not usually for external parts. Um, you know, the only external parts here are the, or external, I mean, things attached to the side of the rocket. Um, the, this, these are external, but they're not attached externally to the rocket itself. For that, there is a different, um, placeholder, and that is called a pod, where you're attaching to the outside of the rocket. Um, you can see that the location of that pod is going to be right there. Um, and then I can start attaching parts to this pod, like, you know, another body tube. Click OK. And you can see it's attached externally to the tube. So, let me see. Do I have comments here? <laughs> I have 
Let's see if I can get to the comments. 35 comments. Let's see if I can get to them. Uh, how come I'm not seeing the comments? Sorry for this. I, you know, since I accidentally closed Safari, comments, it's only showing me the top four. <laughs> Michelle has just walked in to see if I have comments in. She's going to bring me her phone. <laughs> She's off the camera. You're not on camera. Okay. Okay. So the only... So... I hear you now. Hello. The only one that's come in that's kind of... Seems like a good way to say frequently used motor mounts. Yes, Rick. Uh, um, Sub-assemblies would also be good for motor mounts. That's... Yeah, good. Which is right there. Oh, okay. See, it shows 35, but I can't see more than four. <laughs> when I do that, it collapses them. Yeah. So you'll just... I'm only going to see the new comments. So if you have a new comment, uh, Rick, I hope that answered your question. Um, and Rick... Uh, no, Ron, Ron Kaminsky, if you have a new question, uh, I asked the question before, did I answer your question last week? And if and if I did, say yes. And if I didn't, say no, um, so that I know to answer your question. And if you have a new question now, um, we do have a, a little bit of time um, since I ans answered the first one. And I can't tell. <laughs> so I'm going to wing it. Um, we also had a question that came in from Harry from California. He asked, how do you make a clear body tube? Um, and here on this, this uh, rocket, let me get rid of this, um, this pod. Uh, I'm going to completely remove the pod and say yes. So he wants a clear tube, and this would be a good case for a clear body tube. Um, so let me go to 3D and click off of this. It's already a clear. So how do you get that to be a clear tube like that? So you go to the part and it says clear payload tube. That's just the name. That's not how we made it a clear tube. Um, you go and edit the tube and you come over here to the color tab. Let me turn this into 3D so you can see it. Uh, see this screen right here. Okay, so zooming in. Um, I got to, uh, let me cancel out of this just a second. Let me, because it's, it's highlighted here and I don't want it highlighted so I can show you what's going to happen. So when I'm going to come, so now it's, so if I click on it here, in the new version 10.3, it will highlight it. And then you click off of it, it unhighlights it. Um, but now I need to edit it and I could double click on it to edit it, but it's gonna re-highlight it. So I don't wanna do that. So, but I just need it highlighted here, but not blue, because blue is the focus and click edit. And so now I'm looking at the same type of screen where it's not highlighted. And what I think I'll do here is, um, I got it in 3D already. Um, come here to, to color and to change the opacity to make it a clear tube, there's an opacity slider right here. And if I slide it to a opacity of one, see now it's completely solid. And if I make it all the way to the other end at zero, oop, I got a spinny ball. Okay, it just couldn't catch up. Now it's completely, like it's completely gone. But you do want to see it just slightly to tell that there's a tube there. So I make it like 0.1 opacity. And so it's now it's kind of like ghosted. So you can tell there's a tube there and you can see through it. Um, and in fact, if you want to see through it, um, see if there, it's actually see-through. Click off of it. I'm going to add a tube inside of this. 
So I'm going to click on inside tube right up here. I'm going to put something inside of it so I can see it. And I'm just going to select something that's smaller in diameter. Um, you can see it's right there right now. And I'm going to change the length, make it shorter. Oh, I know what's going on. Um, see, it's, it's not inside the tube, it's behind the tube. And that's because this tube is not in our subassembly. Let's see if I can change the location by making this a negative number. Yeah, sure I can. <laughs> cool. Click OK there. And now I'll click off of this, make sure that the whole tube is, uh, the whole rocket is not ghosted. And I can actually see through it inside of that tube. So I can see, you know, so now we do have a, actually a clear tube with a tube inside of it. So we can actually see that. So Harry in California, that's how you do that. Uh, so we got a couple of new questions here. We got uh, Joshua Drummond says, hi from Massachusetts. L. Anzik says, even when you have a problem, it's great. <laughs> Michelle was saying that to me this morning. She says that people love to see me make mistakes. Um, teaches us how to work through those times when we're trying to figure out a problem. Yes, it's true, Al. Um, that is the whole goal of RockSim Live, is even when you have a problem, how to work through it. Um, I have problems. There's, there's so many features in RockSim that even I can't remember them all. But it's just a matter of playing around, just like I did here with that inside tube. It wasn't in the right location, so I just played. I just played with the location slider and made it a negative number, and I got it to be where I wanted it to be. Um, L. Ansek did, Tim, great job on your paper about running launches and its slowdown problems. And he gave me three thumbs up. Well, thank you, L. I appreciate that. I. I'm like everybody else. When a, when a rocket launch is running slow, it, it annoys me as much as anybody and probably even more so because, because if you know how to fix it and it's running slow and you're not allowed to fix it, it's like, eh, I know how to fix this. I want to fix it. Please let me fix it. <laughs> um, okay. So Elizabeth writes, I agree. It, it was really insightful and great information for launch operations. So cool. So I don't have any more questions that I, I can actually see in the comments here on, on Facebook. Um, so um, I'm open to questions. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it in now how to use something in Roxim. Um, if you don't, what happens is I start playing. And, I, and if I'm going to play, I want to play in Roxim Pro uh, because we are getting really close to releasing Roxim Pro. And if you've never seen Roxim Pro, this is what it looks like. It looks very much like Roxim. It's got a couple of extra buttons on top. Um, it's got this button right here, and this is the scatter plot button. Um, and then it's got an extra tab here. Actually, there's two tabs. One is CD, CB override, and another one is CNA, CP override. And these are the really complex ones that even I don't know fully how to use. It's, it's kind of a holdover from a program called Splash. Roxim Pro came about more than 10 years ago. It might have been even 15 years ago now, uh, where it's a six degree of freedom simulator. So what does six degrees of freedom mean? Um, I'm noticing over here, Brian Barbalis asks, when will 10.3 be available? Uh, Brian, it's going to be soon. We want to get it out as quickly as possible. Uh, we are testing it right now. Um, when I do these Roxim Lives, I discover things that I don't like about it. And one of them is um, one of the things that I, I think I do want to, to be fixed. 
Let me show you Brian real quick here before I go back to playing. Um, one of the things that I, that I that's cool about this new feature of being able to click on parts and highlight them. Come on, click, clicky, clicky, clicky. <laughs> um, is that you can you, you can you can find parts. But then the other thing is when I go to edit it, like I wanted to change the opacity, when I go to edit it here, it's also highlighted and I can't unhighlight it. You know, I can't make the rest of the rocket solid from the editor screen. So this editor screen right here, I think needs to be fixed before we release it because otherwise you're gonna have the same problems that I'm having and I don't want you to have those problems. So, um, so that I know I wanna change before we release it. Otherwise it was ready to go. Um, so, so Brian, I don't have a, a question for you. Uh, Joseph uh, types in, in the simulator, what does it mean if the nose cone turns red? An asset? An asset? On ascent? What happens if the nose cone turns red on ascent? Uh, there, there's one word in there, and that's the an. And I'm not sure if that should be an on or an an. Um, Joseph, if you could uh, kind of clarify, I'll, I'll be happy to answer your question. Um, so going back to Roxim Pro while I'm waiting for Joseph to type in a qu uh, his response, uh, I'm going to just open up the Avion here and I'm going to talk about what six degree of freedom means. Um, so when you run a simulation and you choose an engine, and I'm just going to choose any engine, it doesn't matter. Um, an S to C6, since everybody's familiar with a C6, and I'm going to select the delay and click OK, and it loads the engine in there. Under flight events, it's going to deploy it at maximum ejection. So here's six degrees of freedom. The, the new thing here is I've got an azimuth angle that I'm launching from. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click flight profile, and you'll see what's different here. And I've, I've shown this before, and people have seen it. Um, so now we're seeing an actual three-dimensional um, on a world view of the rocket. And it is true three-dimensional, except for the houses aren't three-dimensional, because it's an aerial photo that's, a, that's laid over the top of a globe. Um, but the rocket is sitting right down here, and down here in this corner we have a close-up view of the rocket so you can see what's going on with the rocket. And I can hit play, and the rocket launches, and you can see it's arcing over, and down here it's, it's arcing over, and now we're obscured in the smoke, but as soon as the smoke clears we can say, hey, all of a sudden the rocket is vertical, uh, which means that something has changed, and if I zoom in here, Come on, zoom in faster. Yeah, zoom in faster. You can see that the, the rocket is under parachute right now and it's descending down to the ground. And that's, we're not seeing the parachute because I can't make this small enough to actually see the parachute because the, seeing the rocket is more important than seeing the parachute. You can see the smoke and the fire down here. Uh, it's way cool. So let me stop that. So that's what six degrees of freedom means is, is, is the rocket re actually reacting to the wind and you can go in any compass direction and you can pitch and yaw and roll as well as translate up and crosswind and side wind uh, with the wind. Um, so that's what six degree of freedom means. But the, these new buttons up here gives you a different perspective on the rocket launch. Um, so um, if, if I, uh, I'm gonna run another simulation here real quick. Ascent, misspelled, ascent. I'm just looking at Joseph. What, if, if the nose cone turns red and, and on ascent, the, the word that I'm looking for, Joe, is is it an or on? 
because I'm not sure you got to kind of clarify where you're seeing it on what screen in Roxam. So, Joe, that's my question. Um, so getting back here, what I'm going to do here, one of the features in Roxam Pro that's not in Roxam is the ability to run multiple simulations really fast with different conditions. So to see where the rocket might land um, when things have changed. And what I'm going to change here is uh, the azimuth and the elevation angle. And maybe I'll change the wind, but I don't want to change anything else in the simulation. So what I'm going th here is I'm zeroing everything else out. So I'm absolutely certain that the total impulse of this rocket is um, I got a C6 in here, which a C6 is like 9.6 Newton seconds. So I'm absolutely certain that that impulse hasn't changed. The only thing that I want to change is um, the azimuth angle and the elevation angle. And maybe I'll change the wind direction too. So uh, I'm going to say that my azimuth, you know, I go out there and I launch the rocket. Is it absolutely dead center straight up or is it off just a little bit? So I'm going to say it could be off up to five degrees. And my, uh, well, that was elevation, elevation angle. So now my azimuth angle is, is a compass direction. So north is zero degrees, east is 90 degrees, south would be 180 degrees, west would be 270 degrees. But when I'm launching it, say I'm launching it towards the, I was launching it towards the west. Um, am I actually dead center on, you know, 270 degrees or is it off a little bit? And, you know, my azimuth could be off a lot. So I'm going to say it could be off up to 10 degrees. Um, my wind direction, again, is the wind coming directly out of the west? You know, absolutely 100% certain that it's coming out of 270 deg degrees direction. And I don't know. Um, so I could say it could be off as much as 10 degrees. And then the velocity. Is the velocity, if I said this is an 8 mile an hour wind, is it actually 8 miles an hour or is it 5 to 9? You know, because wind comes in gusts and we don't know exactly what it's going to be. So I'm going to say it could vary as much as 4 miles an hour. So 4 mile an hour is lower than 8 miles or 4 miles an hour higher than eight miles. So it could be anywhere from four miles an hour to 12 miles an hour uh, wind gusts, anywhere in between there. Um, and then I wanna run, let's, let's run uh, 100 simulations. So I'm gonna say, run this 100 times. So I'm gonna say go and launch. And it's gonna run this 100 times and it's, it's telling me it's gonna take approximately 32 seconds to complete all 100 simulations. And it's doing a back to back and it's loading them into memory. And what I wanna find is where this rocket might land with these uncertainties of elevation angle, azimuth angle, wind speed and wind direction. Let's find out what they are. And Joseph, while I'm doing that, Joseph says on the simulator graphic display, so I, I think, Joseph, you're talking the 2D flight profile. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, we, we have plenty of time for that, so we'll get to that. So it just ran the, the launch, and it was identical to that last launch that we did. Um, but if I come up here to the uncertainty plot and click on it, I've got a couple of options. I can plot it in, in Roxim or I can plot it on Google Earth. <clears throat> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with showing it in, on Roxim and show you what that looks like. And it brought this chart up right here. So how do you read this chart? Um, so you, you come up here and you, up here at the top, the, the blue squares are, or the blue circles are the uncertainty points the nominal landing point is the orange one, or it's red, it's kind of right there. And then the launch point is a purple one, which is down here. So my launch is down here. I launched it to the west. Um, 
<clears throat> and then there was some wind and it blew the rocket. And so if, if everything was 100% perfect and I knew exactly I was launching, you know, at, at the correct angle, then there was no deviation. I knew for certain it was going there. Um, and I knew the exact azimuth angle and I knew the exact wind at the time of launch and the exact direction the wind was coming from. Right here, right there where my pointer finger is, is where it would have landed. But because I'm uncertain about all those conditions, by running a hundred simulations back to back with random selection of numbers in inside of those points, I get a landing plot that looks like this. You know, it could be anywhere from 800 feet away this direction and 800 feet that direction, which is pretty far away. As the crow flies, it would be that line. And I could be even closer. I could be, you know, probably the closest point would be right here to my la my launch point, um, which is, so that's what this plot is. And so you might say, well, what does it take to land over here at that point? So I just clicked on that point and it brought up what the errors were to, cr to make it land over here at that point. And so my uh, azimuth, error was 41 degrees. So somehow my azimuth angle swung way around to over here. And I also had some wind errors. Um, I had a direction error. Uh, there was actually two, there's actually two winds here. There's my surface wind and my wind up above. Um, and it, they're both varying because in, in Rocks and Pro you have multiple wind levels and you need at least two. You need a ground wind and an upper wind. Um, so so I had actually four errors right there. And it tells me what those errors were. So um, one of the errors was instead of being eight miles an hour, it was 4.3, 4.53 miles an hour. And then the other one was, uh, it was a negative two miles an hour. Um, so that, if you were to put those into your simulations, that's how you would get to that point. So I'll click OK. Um, and I'm going to go back up here. And this time I'm going to show it on Google Earth, that same plot on Google Earth. And it's launching Google Earth right now. And it's uh, zooming in. And you can kind of see where we're going. And we're in, uh, actually we're in New Jersey. And I've got to come down here, over here to the side, and I've got to turn all these things on. Oh, there it is. It was below my screen. All right. That's why I wasn't seeing it. So remember when we were in the, the launch visualizer before, which what we call our 3D animation, um, we were on this field, and you remember the baseball field there? Well, there was the launch point right there. And this is the trajectory. And all these things out here are those uncertainties. And again, we can click on them. And it brings up the errors that cause them to, uh, you know, what, what it would take for the rocket to land over there. And I actually have two different simulations shown here. I need to turn one of them off because it's. Uh, I just, I just, it's bringing up screens that I don't want brought up. Okay, so I turned off one of the simulations. Okay, so I'm only showing my last simulation. So on this particular launch field, um, you can see all the different points that the rocket might land based on the uncertainties. And most of them are landing on my field. Uh, the ones that I'm concerned about is this one right up here, point number 44. That looks to be in somebody's pool. <laughs> it's pretty close to somebody's pool. Yeah, no, it's actually in the pool. That is cool. The, the, the cool thing about Google Earth, um, that our launch visualizer doesn't have 
is that it has all the buildings and the trees in three dimensions. Um, that we don't have in our launch visualizer. I wish we did, but um, I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen until Microsoft is able to catch up to Google. Um, there's, there's some technical reasons why we can't use Google Earth to make the animation. Um, we can just give you a summary of what the flight looked like, but we can't show the rocket as it's moving around inside of Google Earth, but we can do it inside of the launch visualizer because we built it specifically for that purpose. I would love to show it in Google Earth, but it's, it's a limitation that Google has. Um, so someday maybe they'll, they'll allow us to do it, but right now they say no. Um, so, but that's what it looks like. So that's the cool feature of the uncertainties. I'm going to not save that. I want to get back to, uh, to Joseph's question. So he's in Roxham and he's seeing a red nose cone. Um, so let me go open up a design. Let's just choose the Estes Alpha since it's real quick here. Change. No, I don't care about that. So this is the Estes Alpha, and yeah, let's run a simulation real quick. Um, I'm gonna choose an Estes C65. So this is my quick way of loading motors, is I always go to the summary screen of what was previously launched, because I know those motors work. Um, I shouldn't do that. Uh, but if you wanna load motors quick, you can come up here, just right click on the, uh, the simulation and hit load motors. Um, that is the same thing as coming up over here to the prepare for launch and then choosing the engine. Um, see, now I had to click a second time to, to you know, just even to find the S to C6. Um, but if I, you know, if I wanted the C5, I'd choose C5. Um, and then you'd have to select the delay um, I don't think the Estes C55 has actually been released yet, but it's here in Roxium, so I'm going to choose it. I always like to choose the longest delay because um, I, want, I like my rockets going over the top so I can find the, uh, the optimal delay. So then I'm going to go to flight events and it says deploy at maximum ejection delay, simulation controls I always leave alone, starting state. This is on a 36 inch launch rod and pointing straight up. My launch conditions, um, I'm launching from an altitude of 64 feet, which is, I think it was New Jersey. Um, I'm gonna back it up to 700 feet, which makes it like closer to the rest of the country. Most of the rest of the country is a little bit higher than sea level. And flight profile. So it ran the simulation. So our rocket is down here. So now Joseph says that he is seeing, I just looked again and it's a little red spot next to the nose cone. It comes on near the end of the boost phase and turns off a couple of seconds later. Okay, so I think I know what he's seeing. Um, see right now, the rocket took off. Um, I can tell at this point it's burned out because um, the smoke stops and the first dot. So these dots are just to kind of give us a trajectory, kind of a path that the rocket is following. And each dot is laid down one second apart. So here's one second into the flight, two seconds into the flight, three seconds, four. And as the dots get further apart, you can, you can tell that the rocket is accelerating. And when they start getting closer and closer together, it's decelerating. And when the dots are equal distance apart, like up here where it's coming down under parachute, that means it's coming down at a standard rate. It's not changing at all. It's one second apart. And you usually see that when the, when the speed is not changing. Okay, so he's seeing something right at engine burnout. So let me go back to engine burnout and I'm going down here. I don't know, you can't see this because it's below my screen, but I'm moving the slider bar right here, our time slider. So I can slide the slider bar anywhere along the flight I want. So I'm gonna back up to right at engine burnout. 
So here is, it's getting close. So Joseph, what I think you're seeing, and you're seeing the thrust, you're seeing the force vectors. So if you come here to the preferences button and turn this, click this, and come here to vector overlay. And right now, I mine has none, but if I say, um, show the vectors with scaling, I'm gonna, you can choose any one of them. And I'll say, okay, and click okay, and it reruns the simulation. Okay, so if you can see right here, it's very tiny, but there's a green arrow. So I'm going to see if I can make that arrow bigger so you can see a little bit better. So I'm going back to preferences, to back to vector overlay. And instead of using uniform scaling, I'm going to say non-uniform scaling. And I'm going to say vector length factor of one to make it bigger. Um, and the line width, I'll make it thicker so you can see them. And so the red will be thrust. Drag is green. Torque vector, let me change that to a different color. Um, and click OK. Has to rerun the simulation. OK, so now. OK, so now I can see them. Um, so here's the drag vector, and it's larger, but we're not seeing the red one. So let me go back here to one more time and say drag without scaling, because I want to see the red one, the thrust vector. Click OK. Um, I think what's happening is our thrust vector is getting obscured by the smoke, which is why we're not seeing it. So let me turn the smoke off. So I'm going to uncheck Smoke Trails Rocket, and this will turn off the smoke. So now when it launches, there will be no smoke. I'm st still not seeing the red one. The red one should be a thrust vector. We're seeing the green one, and we're seeing a torque vector. But we're not seeing uh, this. This um, this might be the wind vector. See, I'm learning as I'm going here. This is this is this is Tim trying to figure things out in the 2D flight profile. There's just so much in here. Vector. Let me make this bigger. Vector length vector of 20. And let me change this wind vector to a different color. Uh, different color other than what we're seeing here. So let's make it yellow, bright yellow. Let's see what changes. Oh, look, and now we're seeing the red, the red arrow. Everything has uh, been increased by a factor of 20. So let me, let me turn that down. So now that we know what it does, let's make it a, a value of four. Torque on our factor. Solid line width. So we're not seeing anything that was bright yellow. We're not seeing gravity, but we are seeing a torque vector. Okay, do it again. One more time. I think we're going to have it this time. What I want to see. Okay, so you can see the, the red line is thrust. This blue line is a torque vector, and then the green line is drag. They're still like way too big. So I'm going to change it one more time. Let's go back down to uh, 1.5. Click OK. So man, oh man, for some reason, I can't get I can't get that force vector to show up unless I make it really big. Because I think Joseph, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing that drag, you know, right there. Because uh, force goes along the, the rocket's thrust. I'm at 1.88 seconds into the flight. Um, this is where 
in Roxim Pro. Let me go back to Roxim Pro so I can tell them Roxim Pro are up here. And if I run the simulation, um, flight profile, just run that simulation one more time. And you'll see, we added these force vectors into Roxim Pro. Oh, it's doing all 100. I don't want all 100. I left the uncertainties on. So I just canceled it so it would stop doing them. But um, let me zoom out so you can see the rocket. So the rocket is right here. If I come up here to preferences, this is in Roxim Pro. Uh, you'll see there's also a force vector screen. I'm going to turn off the weather cogging cone and turn on the force vectors. And so my thrust, I'm going to change it to red. And drag will be green, and I'll say OK. So now if I zoom in on the rocket, I should see force vectors. So you can see the vectors. So here's our, our drag vector, and here's our thrust vector. And our thrust vector right now is really big. Um, And you can see at this point in time, we have thrust because we have a flame, but we also have smoke. And again, I can turn the smoke off. I like seeing the flame, but I don't care so much about the smoke for this particular thing. So here's our drag vector. Here's our thrust vector. As, as the rocket speeds up, drag will increase uh, because drag is a function of the velocity of the rocket. So um, drag increases as the square of the velocity. So if, you, if your rocket goes speeds up twice, so it's going twice as fast, the drag actually goes up four times. So that's why you'll see right at engine burnout is when you're going to have maximum amount of drag. Um, so that's, I think, Joseph, that's what you are seeing on that 2D flight profile. Um, Melissa, hello, Melissa. Melissa, I've never seen your name up here before. There was a NASA Roxim used to be Java base, which is no longer works on most computers. Is there a new version? Is this similar? Is it web based? This is cool. <laughs> um, to answer your question, Melissa, I have no idea about NASA. That's not our website. Um, what you're seeing here on the screen today is not web-based. Um, this is all desktop-based. Um, so you have to run it either on Windows or Macintosh because it is desktop-based. But what we are doing in the future is that we are creating a web-based one. Somebody knocking on my door? I heard somebody knock. We are creating a web version of this, we call it the launch visualizer, what you see on the screen right here. The launch visualizer, um, you do need to be connected to the internet to use this because we're pulling in these maps and we're pulling them in from um, Bing on this particular one. And on the other screen that I showed you earlier, that was uh, Google Earth. Um, but you can see that the quality on both of them is pretty good. The difference is on Google Earth, all these buildings and the trees would be actually three-dimensional representations where here they're flat because it's actually an aerial photo that's been laid on top of a grid Earth. Uh, and the grid Earth does have terrain features. So if, if I was near mountains, I would actually see mountains, but this particular launch site is in New Jersey and everything there is close to the ocean, so it's pretty flat. If I was in Colorado, you'd see mountains here. So that answers that question, <laughs> Melissa. Um, uh, Ron Kaminsky asks, can Roxim be used to calculate current wind speed, current wind speed field to get direction we just launch an overstable rocket and it points to the wind source. If we then added its landing distance from the pad, positive or negative, um, we use a known rocket with accurate weight. Could Roxon be used to tell us the accurate wind speed used in the rest of the day's flight? 
Sure, we can guesstimate now. Ah, that is a really good question, Ron. So, so what he's asking here, I believe, is, is the rocket is drifting down to the ground. Um, and we know the distance the rocket landed. The question, Ron, is do we know the peak altitude? And if you had an altimeter on board your rocket, yes, you would know the peak altitude. And if you know the peak altitude and you know the distance it lands, can you estimate the wind speed from that? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> um, if the rocket goes perfectly straight up, because an alt altimeter is only going to measure an altitude, it doesn't me measure, most altimeters don't measure the GPS location of that altitude. Now, so if you had an altimeter like an Altus Metrum or a, uh, yeah, an Altus Metrum Telemega Telemetrum, Easy Mega, you could. Those three measure position and altitude all at the same time. So you need to know the position right there. It's geographic position, um, latitude, longitude, and elevation. And then you need to know the latitude, longitude, and elevation angle of or position of this point. And from that, using three-dimensional geometry, you could figure out the wind speed. So yes, you could do it. It's going to be really hard, though. Um, the easier way to measure when, is to actually bring an anemometer out to your launch site. And there are little portable ones that have, the, you know, they're, they're smaller than a calculator, smaller than your cell phone, and they have a little spinny thing inside of them, and they have a little wind speed indicator on it. So basically what you would do is just take one of those out to the field. They're less than 20 bucks. Uh, you take one of those out to the field, um, and you can measure the wind speed pretty accurately. Um, the only problem is you don't know the wind speed above the ground. Um, and for that, um, again, you would have to use one of those recording altimeters. There's also a website here. Let me bring up a website called Windy. And this is a really cool website. Um, so let me bring it up here. We're going kind of long here. It's windy.com. And you can see, as I brought it up, it um, if I zoom in, you can kind of see these flow lines. Like I'm here in Colorado Springs right now. And this is telling me we've got a, a flow coming from the east. It wraps around. So dead here, right in Colorado Springs, as I'm talking today, oops, I zoomed in too far. You can kind of see the wind, see these little lines here dragging across the screen. That is my wind direction. And let me find where Apogee Components is located. Um, we are, I am looking for Garden of the Gods Road, Dublin, um, that's Woodman, so I'm too far north, Pulpit Rock. Um, right, here we go. So I am located, this is my building right there where my hand is. And here's the wind, and this tells me that the wind, it's given me a direction, so my direction is kind of from the southeast to the north. So east would be 90, south would be 180. So somewhere between 90 and 180 would be the direction. And the wind speed is it's actually pretty slow right now. And over here, off to the very right side of the screen, can you see that on mine? Yes, you can. Is the, if This is surface wind. And if I drag this little slider bar, so now I'm 2,000 feet up you know, and 6,400 feet up, you know. Oh, see here at 7,000 meters, the wind direction has changed. So, so my surface wind is this direction and my upper level wind is a completely different direction, um, which is so cool. And you get that from this website and it's called Windy. Um, so if I, 
bring back this back down. You can see now the wind, and it's like it's like a, a huge wind shear right between 4,000 meters and 3,000 meters. You got a, this big wind shear. So if you were flying an air, or if you were launching a rocket, and you got up to 3,000 meters, and then somewhere into 4,000 meters, all of a sudden the wind's going to take it in a completely different direction. Um, so I recommend this launch site, windy.com. Um, we wanted to be able to bring this into Roxim Pro, but unfortunately, windy.com charges a big fee to use their data. So we're trying to find a different data source. But when we re re release Roxim Pro or the visualizer, that web-based version, it's not going to be in there. You're going to have to enter the wind manually at different levels. And where would you get those different levels? Well, you would get them from windy.com. So I have no relation to Windy. I'm just, you know, this is a shout out to them. Uh, this is awesome. I, I really encourage you to check it out. Okay, so we're, we are way long here again. So let me change computer screens. <laughs> um, hopefully I answered all your questions. You know, uh, Ron, send me another email if we didn't answer your question on airfoiling fins and offset weights in the rocket. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to answer all your questions. This is um, the Lodestar. We do sell this here at Apogee if you ever, ever need a Lodestar. Uh, I think they also come in bulk packs. So if you're with a school um, looking for a nice rocket that has a big payload bay on it, or you can drop an altimeter in there, or a lizard, or some kind of insect. Don't use mammals, but uh, use something with an exoskeleton. Insects are really great payloads. Um, it doesn't really hurt those bugs. Okay, so uh, we're going to kind of end this here. Um, i got to find the end. And uh, <laughs> I don't have an end button. Um, so I'm just going to actually turn off my uh, computer to end this because I don't know any other way to end it because... My Facebook feed is already messed up. So thanks for coming. Uh, we will be back next week, same time, same Bat channel. Um, for those of you who remember Batman. Um, 10 o'clock uh, Mountain Time, 12 noon Eastern Time. That's when we do these things. We try to go an hour long, answering all your rocks and questions, giving you um, a future perspective of what's coming in Roxim uh, because I'm testing it out as I'm using it um, and the new version 10.3 should be coming soon and then 10 Roxim Pro with these new features that will be coming soon and then the web-based version that one I know pretty much when that one's coming that's going to be um, late this year probably November December it's it's moving along pretty good right now I can't show it to you yet because if I show it to you, I'm going to reveal the URL and how to get to it. Um, and it's a special place on the Apogee website. And I don't want you going there yet because you could, um, you know, reveal too much. Uh, but what you see what, that I demonstrated today is, is kind of the stuff that you're going to see. Okay, so I'm going to end this. I'm just going to close my computer screen and hopefully everything just shuts off. So in three, two, one, go out and launch some rockets. <laughs>